Joining me now is Chris Showalter. He's the CEO of Life Zone Metals. Great to see you, Chris. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no pleasure. Thanks for having me today. So to start with, if you could give us a, an overview of uh, Life Zone's hybrid strategy of mm -hmm. uh, basically advancing uh, battery materials in Tanzania and at the same time processing them sustainably through uh, a patented uh, process. Uh, I know your company has more than 100 patents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And I think, um, yeah, so in terms of that that hybrid approach you mentioned, so so what we do is we really, we're in a position to provide, you know, I like to say solutions to the uh, mining industry to, to clean up the supply chain. And I think um, our ability to provide a clean processing solution to some of these new sources of battery metals, it really empowers the, you know, the, the mining companies to be able to deliver on a lot of these sustainability targets that they've, they've articulated to, uh, to their investors and um, to their shareholders. So, so really we bring technological capability to unlock new sources of battery metals, but then also clean up existing supply chains by, by really focusing on removing the dirtiest component of the supply chain, which is smelting. So our Hydromet flow sheet engineering and designs, um, yeah, they, they, they take away that step and that's a, that's a fundamental driver to, to cleaning up the, uh, the supply chain. We're going to have you uh, take us through the hydromet process uh, in in just a moment. But as far as uh, Kabanga and other uh, globally significant nickel uh, projects, can you give us a, a sense of the, uh, the the grade and, and the size of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Kabanga deposit. I mean, interestingly, this has been around for for quite some time. It was discovered by the UN Development Program in the '70s, and it's really been. Uh, pretty well known as a, a tier one nickel project. And it's really been sitting on the shelf for quite some time because um, there really hasn't been the installed infrastructure and power um, available. And I think what has really changed recently for the Kabanga project um, to really unlock it is some of the commitments that the Tanzanian government has made over the past five years. Uh, we now have access to um, grid power about 68 kilometers away. And there is a new hydroelectric dam um, coming down from the Northwest. So uh, the standard gauge rail being built across the country. So there's a lot of enabling infrastructure that's been committed to by the government of Tanzania. And the Kabanga deposit was previously held by Barrick and Glencore, and it's been phenomenally drilled out. It's a very well studied, understood drilled ore body. Um, you know, the initial grades, I mean, nickel at approximately 2.6%. Nickel equivalent upwards of 3.1 historically. Um, this really it puts it in a special category in terms of uh, nickel projects, and and really as you know in the industry, grade is king. And for us to 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 be in the market right now, bringing this project into development, um, it's really it's an asset of this size and quality that's going to be firmly in that lower quartile. And the, and the nickel industry is tough right now. I mean, prices are weak. There's been oversupply coming out of Indonesia. Um, so a lot of marginal nickel projects are going to be very challenged to get into production, but we're we're very fortunate just given the grade and quality of Kabanga that it really sets itself apart. I think that's part of the attraction uh, to bring BHP in as a partner. Yeah, I mean, they they, they understood very well the, the quality of this ore body. They actually had a, a joint venture in the Kabanga project historically in the 90s. So they the body of knowledge BHP has um, goes back to really them being part of some of the initial detailed drilling programs historically. Right, and we'll circle back to BHP uh, in just a, a moment, but uh, back to uh, to Hydromet uh, mm -hmm. and this, uh, this patented solution that you have, how would you say that it, uh, and, and could you explain it in, in basic terms, how it mm -hmm. compares to traditional ways of recycling secondary metals? Mm -hmm. um, so our Hydromet process was really developed uh, primarily around the PGM industry. So the PGM industry, um, you know, our founder, Keith Liddell, uh, and his partner, Mike Adams, our chief technology officer, really they, the, the motivation was to find a way that they could liberate a junior miner in South Africa from the subservient payabilities of um, what you see in the, in the majors in South Africa. So the, the, the big four refiners and processors in South Africa um, really are able to dictate terms to a lot of the junior miners. And so the idea was economically driven. How do we how do we liberate a junior miner uh, to capture more value as a project? Um, so that was the, the economic motivation. And, and Keith then um, worked on developing, uh, you know, this Hydromet flow sheet and, and really was funded by private investors. Um, and we're now into a commercialization phase. I think 
to, to your question on Hydromet, um, you know, Hydromet can be a very wide definition. So, I mean, even, uh, you know, cyanide use in gold is technically Hydromet. Um, but for our specific expertise, um, we have, as you said, about just over 100 patents. Primarily, those are uh, gold and PGM patents. So, real big focus on precious metals. And then going into base metals um, with the Kabanga project is going to be um, what we'd like to see as a new series of patents. So, so we've been able to to start within the PGM industry, but then commercialize and apply our expertise in the hydromet space to um, other other commodities. Um, and we're demonstrating that not only at Kabanga, but then in the partnership with Glencore on the recycling side. All right, uh, shifting gears here, uh, Chris, you've said that a real defining moment for life zone metals will be when you come out with a definitive feasibility study for Kabanga and for, uh, the, uh, for the, the processing side of the business. Uh, I know you can't give us any hard numbers, but we believe right. that the, the DFS is coming in several weeks time. Can you give us a, a little sneak peek, a preview of what to expect? Um, yeah, I'll try to be careful. Um, give you a little bit. Um, yeah, so so the team has been very hard at work. Um, you know, we have DRA Global um, as the uh, engineer working on this, and so so what I can say is we we had indicated that kind of end of Q3 this year we'd be wrapping up the DFS, and um, we're on that trajectory. Um, so um, so once we get the uh, you know the chapters concluded, um, we'll start um, working on the timing of an announcement. So the you know what, what I can say is the, uh, you know, I would expect, um, you know, to have a have a very positive um, study uh, delivered. Yeah, as you said, I can't really get into details right now, but I think, um, you know, the, the 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 amount of work that's gone in, and I think what I can highlight is that um, this has been a highly collaborative process with BHP as well. So BHP um, has been you know participating not only in steer codes but technical committees. So um so this has been a collaborative approach um so uh yeah there's been a lot of cooperation but i think yeah numbers wise i'll have to hold off we're getting pretty close so uh i'll i'll wait for that announcement very prudent nicely done uh very good now uh uh you talked about and touched on uh, indonesian nickel we talked with uh, mark selby the ceo of canada nickel recently oh. And he talks about blood nickel coming out of Indonesia and the environmental and labor problems that have been created there. So can you speak to Life Zone's mission to be mm -hmm. an alternative to that kind of nickel and, and, and a counterweight to that? Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think Mark's very eloquent and, uh, you know, really calling attention to, you know, I, I haven't heard him say blood nickel, but I think it's c categorically we know that the nickel coming out of Indonesia is some of the dirtiest product um it's clear cutting rainforest it's you know throwing deposits on the sea floors it's coal fired it's you know upgrading nickel pig iron uh requires multiple thermal treatment steps and multiple smelting steps and that is energy intensive so it increases the overall co2 implication so and these are going into smelters in china so it's 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 the worst case um and i'm always fascinated because if you look at the the massive disparity between um Indonesia versus say what we're forecasting at Kabanga, um, we are looking at somewhere between two to four tons of CO2 per ton of nickel because we're utilizing clean hydromet. Um, primarily, we, you know, Tanzania is going to have somewhere upwards of close to 70% hydropower. Um, and in Indonesia, you're seeing anywhere from 50 to 80 tons of CO2 per ton of nickel. So it is a, it is a major concern. And we, we are in a process, and this is, you know, we announced publicly that we're in a process of um, engaging off takers, so automobile manufacturers. And I think talking to the auto manufacturers, I mean, several have categorically said to us they cannot take Indonesian nickel. The the policy constraints, the the amount of CO two, um, and if you and if you look at uh, Tesla's annual report, um, they highlight that somewhere around thirty, uh, I think it's thirty two percent of the CO2 footprint of a Tesla vehicle is due to the nickel in the cathode. So that is uh, a very big problem. And I think where where we are is really kind of being the anti-Indonesian alternative. And I think there's, it puts Kavanga specifically in a very competitive position because we are um, intending to produce some of the cleanest nickel 
um, and that's going to be highly sought after. So for the automobile manufacturers um, to to compete for the nickel and cobalt coming out of Cabanga, um, we're we're in an incredibly strong position. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to negotiate uh, um, a green premium. We're not there yet, um, but it's not for lack of trying. But I think that'll actually emerge when when the market's ready. Um, and also our cobalt, we're non-artisanal mined cobalt, so uh, non-DRC cobalt. So um, really providing an alternative in Indonesia, um, I think that's really important. Now, continuing with uh, electric vehicles and electric vehicle batteries, do you think that consumers are becoming more aware of where uh, their battery materials are coming from? And if so, what what opportunity does that present, do you think, uh, for LifeZone? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I think if you, when you, if you're going to go and book a flight, your flight now shows the overall CO2 pounds, you know, on your booking. So there's a, there's a transparency, there's a disclosure that is um, becoming readily available to the consumer. And I think that's, we're seeing that emerge now uh, with the battery passport um, in the, some of several of the uh, EU countries. So there is going to be uh, in a number of, uh, countries a, a disclosure of where the co2 is coming from so and if they get into the granularity of getting into which metal is contributing the most co2 to that vehicle or which component then it's going to be hard to you know to, to hide um and I think that's where the nickel ad from indonesia causes a big problem because if the, the the car manufacturers have to disclose on basically on this you know if you're in the showroom and you're looking on the you know the sticker on the window that's showing the price and all the the, uh, the details, and they show that this you know is is heavily um, nickel CO two uh, um, uh, it, it contained. Yeah, I think that 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 brings consumer awareness. So I think um, I think it's it, it's good for the industry. I think it's it, it's a work in progress, but I think we. We're, we're definitely in a position where, specifically for us, selfishly as LifeZone, we're going to be in a, um, a very competitive um, position to, to to provide the cleanest product, and, and that can be proudly demonstrated on the uh, on the window of an uh, electric vehicle. Chris, you mentioned a BHP as a partner. It's also a shareholder. You mm -hmm. have a, a joint venture with Glencore. So can you uh, describe those relationships and, and the shareholder base in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're we're quite we're quite proud that as we commercialize our expertise and our hydromet um, capability, that we're doing it with two of the premier mining partners in the world. And I think that's a that's an incredible demonstration of of where we are as a company that we're able to come to market and uh, you know with two major players. So huge endorsements um, as we break into the market um, with BHP. The the relationship uh, so they have invested a uh, hundred million into LifeZone. Um, the bulk of that going into the Cabanga Nickel project, and they have a 17% stake um, as a shareholder, and they have an option to go to 60%. So that's that's their investment um, option that's contained in our our uh, agreement with BHP, and that's not unusual for a, a major to have a pathway to a, a larger shareholding. And so the the definitive feasibility study that is as we discuss is coming to a conclusion um, that will be. Uh, really, the the trigger for BHP to then transition into um, the the option agreement, um, and I can say the you know the, the collaboration with BHP. I mean, our teams are are busy on a daily basis together, working through um, all the work streams, all the components of uh, the project. So, um, so very you know very uh, you know intense engagement right now, especially as we get closer to the end of the uh, feasibility study, um, and then on the Glencore partnership. Um, we have a uh, joint venture 50-50 with, with Glencore to do AutoCAT recycling in North America. Um, Glencore has taken a, a, a pretty strong strategic approach to recycling overall. And I think that that was a natural fit for us because what we see is the problem in, in, in specifically in the US, North America, if you're going to recycle something, you, you, you can throw it into a, a furnace. Very easy. It works. But if you're going to recycle material and put it into a, a high intensity CO2 emitting process like smelting, which is what we're trying to solve for, um, you're just compounding the overall footprint of that metal, um, well, the CO2 footprint over time. So if you keep recycling material in dirty furnaces, 
um, you're really not uh, you're really not solving the problem. So for us, by providing a, a clean hydromet processing solution to auto catalytic converters in in the U.S., um, we deliver you know properly green material and and the consumers, uh, specifically some of the jewelers. Um, it's public that Pandora and Tiffany's pay green premiums for clean recycled material. We would have the um, the cleanest possible recycled material. Um, so that's, and, and the partnership with Glencore, um, we're in the uh, advanced uh, piloting phase for that project. Um, and I think once we establish the first plant, that's plant number one, but I think that's something that we can, you know, scale up quite quickly in terms of multiple plants. So to really disrupt and and provide clean processing solution for the recycling of auto catalytic converters in North America. Um, that's a really exciting project. And so something we're, um, you know, really moving forward with Glencore to, uh, to advance that. Lastly, Chris, uh, Life Zone Metals has been public on the New York Stock Exchange for more mm -hmm. than a year now. Uh, as you look into the rest of 24 and into 25, can you summarize your thoughts here, summarize the investment case for Life Zone mm -hmm. Metals? Yeah, I think the investment case for us, I mean, I think, I mean, we, yeah, we, uh, as they say, we're one year seasoned on the NYSE. Um, we came public at $10. We're currently trading around six. So investors, the equity case for us, I mean, we can get in at a discount to BHP. We have major catalysts coming up that we um, have, have announced uh, in terms of the conclusion of the DFS, announcing of an offtake agreement with partners. Um, and moving forward with Glencore on the AutoCAP project. So, so we've got a very nice uh, path for positive catalysts going forward. And I think, you know, when you look at the past year, you know, we've delivered on what we said we were going to do. So we delivered the, the updated mineral resource statement end of last year. Um, we delivered on the joint venture that we indicated we were going to be announcing, uh, and that ended up being Glencore. And we're on time for the feasibility study, uh, which we'll announce here um you know in the near term so i think from a to, to to have exposure to really the only pure u.s listed clean nickel cobalt um company and then also have the ability to invest in clean processing technology i think we, i think we you know we're a great story and i think we're um you know for investors uh, that want to get into battery metals that want to get into battery metals that are non-Indonesian with major partners like BHP and Glencore. Um, yeah, I think we, you know, we're, we're, we're going to deliver on these projects and this is only the beginning. So we see uh, the ability to continue to, you know, produce clean processing solutions for mining companies um, going forward. And um, we're really just now at the beginning. So exciting times ahead. Well, thanks for uh, shedding some light on the story today, Chris. We really appreciate it. We'll see you again. Excellent. Thanks again for your time. Absolutely. You too. Chris Showalter, he is the CEO at LifeZone Metals. Thanks for watching today, and we'll see you next time.